Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 48 of 3D's Awesome Guest Battle. I can't believe I reached 48. I, think, I didn't think I was getting past eight. Uh, my guest tonight is a man who has done it all in voice acting. You may know this gentleman's work from uh, such animated shows like Duckman, Garfield and Friends, Transformers, and of course, mine and my guest host's favorite, Aria Monsters. He, was, he has done it all, and he has... Uh, been nominated for many awards. One, one of my favorites, was the 1994 Annie Award for his uh, Best Achievement in Voice Actor work, Award for his work on Duckman as Corn Fed. My guess at the time is Mr. Greg Berger. Greg, how are you today, sir? Woohoo! Thanks for having. I'm good. How are you? Good, you? <laughs> uh, now, uh, before we get to the questions, though, I do want to introduce, uh, once again, my, my good friend, and he will be guest co-host in this episode, uh, Mr. Christopher Patty. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Hey, Chris. Now, uh, Mr. Berger, before we get into the Duckman-related questions, and, and uh, I, we have a lot of questions we've got to ask you, because <laughs> both Chris and I have been a uh, fan of your works for many, many, many years. I mean, I mean, uh, I, I, Chris, I'm not sure how long you were a fan of uh, uh, Mr. Berger for, but I can tell you I was a fan of this man since I was in diapers, and, you know, I'm very honored to say that. Um, Mr. Berger, I do want to ask... Uh, of course, this might be your typical cliche question, but it, that is, um, when did you get your first big break in voice acting? Oh, man, there are so many breaks along the way and so much, you know, I, the first voice tape I ever made, voice demo, um, I had decided that I, I thought uh, that was something that people did and that I could do when I got a wall and sack tape recorder at a yard sale. I did needle drops of... Uh, of classical music. I got a uh, uh, copy from newspapers and magazines, and I made a voice demo in my house, uh, and I thought, uh, I'm, I'm doing this. And I uh, delivered it to advertising agencies. I grew up in the Midwest, and I uh, delivered it in St. Louis. And I owe so much of my career, anybody of anybody's career, to just equal parts of naivete uh, stupidity and determination. You know, if you don't tell yourself uh, that you're going to jump in and, and do this and, and, you know, not be afraid to make a fool of yourself, nothing ever happens for anybody. Um, I like the guy who said you run as fast as you can toward a wall till you smash into it, get up, dust yourself off and start running as fast as you can in another direction. Uh, that's, that's how things happen. You know, success, success happens often for people who are too busy to, uh, to stop and realize that they're pursuing it all, along the way because they're too busy just being busy. So I delivered this ridiculous attempt at a voice demo to advertising agencies in St. Louis where I live. And I got a call from a guy named Al Lages who I'll be thanking uh, to my dying day because he said, hey, I got your demo. I said, yeah. He said, uh, that's the worst voice demo I've ever heard in my entire life. He said, however, he said, you got a really interesting voice and you've got a lot of guts to do that. He said, uh, I do a lot of commercial production in St. Louis. He said, um, periodically, I'll book more time than it actually takes to do a spot. He said, I want you to come and watch the people who do it, do it. He said, I don't know why. He said, you got my attention. And he said, uh, if I have extra time at the end of a session, he said, I'll throw some copy at you. He said, we'll record some stuff. And he said, uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll get you something that sounds credible and competitive and uh, see if there might be an opening for you here. So... My feeling about uh, like life in general and cartoons and stupid stuff and fun stuff and, and meaningful stuff, all of it uh, is uh, I'm kind of a terminal optimist and I believe that opportunity happens for everybody, but uh, the people that mistake it for just another moment are doomed to find out that it becomes one unless you seize it. So there my uh, naivete and, and uh, idealism sort of uh, paid off and it paid off more often than that. Uh, there's another notable, but we'll get to that later in the, in the interview that involves 
Gordon Hunt, who was doing all the voice direction at Hanna Barbera. But that was after I got out of the Midwest. I went from St. Louis to Chicago. I got cast in a national tour because theater is my first love. Theater took me to the West Coast where, um, you know, I found a career. But a career only happens one job at a time. All you can do is exceed expectation when you get the opportunity. And uh, more often than not, that will lead, whether you know it or not, to another opportunity. Maybe not consecutively, but it begins to build your chops and build your ability to walk into a room where nobody knows you and try to convince them that you're the you're the guy, you're the woman, you're the you're you're what you're the aspirin for their headache. Um, that's how it's done, son. That's 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 the gig. Um, my my agent for life uh said the way you build a career is one job at a time he said just keep uh just keep leaving them happy that they took a chance on you and that that really is uh that's that's kind of a recipe for good living very cool and uh very 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 respectable sarah like uh now you've done many projects so um you know dating back to the 80s so and uh Christopher, you have a question for Greg, right? Oh, well, uh, you weren't going to ask him about his uh, voiceover as uh, we're, adult children? We're going to ask that. Um, I, let's first, because I, I want to know what uh, Greg wants, uh, Greg's opinion on the work that you chose, the question that you chose first. All right, all right. Uh, way back in the 80s, you provided... Oh, don't few... fight over me. <laughs> <laughs> Icky scrum, Oblina, return to your seats. Somebody ask a question. Oh, I feel four again. Thank you so much, sir. <laughs> well, okay, then, uh, way back in the 80s, the late 80s, you provided a few voices for This Is America, Charlie Brown. How did yeah. it feel to be part of the rare occasion where you voiced visible adults in the Charlie Brown franchise? Um, well, my relationship with Mendelssohn uh, and, and United Media Mendelssohn and all of the above is just... Uh, you know, we, we've we've been connected for decades, uh, but it felt phenomenal. Are you kidding? To be part of the Charlie Brown universe, uh, uh, adult or or not adult, I was one of the Wright brothers, and Frank Frank Welker and I were the Wright brothers. Well, we were the wrong brothers, but uh, but uh, we we played the Wright brothers. Um, but my God, you know, you have to understand that when I was a kid. That was me, you know, every Saturday watching Bugs and Daffy. And there are there are things that are iconic to me from the get-go. And to be invited into something that iconic uh, along the way and, and that epic an adventure and journey and, and uh, you know, plenty of history included in, in that Charlie Brown also. My God, you know. I, I, I live for those opportunities and I live for those experiences. It felt great. And plus, you know, we're the Wright brothers. Cool. Cool. And um, well, uh, Christopher mentioned too, like the question I had too, I, I had to always wonder this, sir. And it's one of your, uh, one of your first works in voiceover works. And that is your memories on doing the 1978 ringing bell as adult Churin. As what? Adult, uh, Jerry. I may not, I may not have a memory. It was a, a Japanese anime, and you did the dub version of uh, Adult uh, Churin. That was the name of the character. The, the uh, it's called Ringing Bell. If I, uh, I did so much Japanese into English. Uh, the most notable was Transor Z, uh, hmm. which was Mazinga Z in Japan. The one you're naming, uh, I'm sure it was. Uh, a job that I that I didn't have that much of a sense of involvement with. Uh, we would get there were a group of us who were dependable, and you have to understand that in the dubbing universe, you you uh, sort of build a reputation. If you can do more than just fill the flaps, anyone can. Not anyone can fill the flaps, but some people are hired and never look further than that or deeper into the third dimension of a character. But it, it still it still passes as dubbing if you can do the same thing, but add a third dimension to the character. If you can find the humanity within the dubbing and still make the flaps fit the animation, then you 
got a dubbing career, then you, then then you get remembered. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. The um, one thing the the staccato reads that are so cliche are cliche because it doesn't involve doing the acting work of trying to breathe uh, humanity into the character along the way. Well, I I pride myself on that, and I'm not going to let anything go without doing the homework to make the character a character, not just exchange languages and lip flaps uh, so they fit. That's just my, that's my pride of workmanship or whatever. I see. And I do want to get uh, your memories on doing one of my favorite shows of all time. Me and my sister used to watch it as, a, watch it as little kids, and that is your work as a B sitter on Fantastic Max. Well, thank you. I wasn't about to let him go into space in a dirty diaper. <laughs> um, that was the first series I ever did at Hanna-Barbera. And uh, I, I just thought it was brilliantly conceived and written. Uh, Kelly Ward was involved, who is still a friend. Uh, you would know him from the movie Grease. You would know him from his Disney stuff. You would know him from his own acting career. I just did a convention with him not too terribly long ago before the world stopped uh and uh we've been friends for a lifetime also you know when i when i find people along the way the worthwhile people in the industry out of the industry i don't let go and and uh happily i've been able to maintain friendships for decades so he wrote this fantastic show uh this is the other half of the story i started earlier but i was doing a play in los angeles called Cloud Nine. And um, it was jumping in and out of character, really sort of like acting aerobics for everyone on stage. I had been seen, and this is another story about sort of opportunity. Uh, I, I started as an understudy in that show. And the parts that I was understudying, the guy uh, last minute, I don't know if it was uh, traffic or I ran out of gas, something happened. And at half hour, he called and said he couldn't get there. He was unable to get to the theater. So I suited up, convinced, uh, by the way, that I would never go on as an understudy. But I took it anyway. I thought, well, you know, it's a good experience. I'll probably never get on stage. But I did get on stage. So that night, that night that I went on, Gordon Hunt was in the audience. Well, Gordon Hunt came back stage at, or to the stage door had the stage manager run and get me. I came out and he said, if you're as versatile as what I just saw on stage, he said, we should know about you at Hanna-Barbera. And I just, I just thought, you know, it's like everything stopped and my life went into slow motion. I honestly thought to myself, if I say thank you, he's going to forget this by the time he gets to his car and it's just going to like float past. So I didn't do that. And I said, well, you've had my demo for several months. If you can move it from the bottom of the pile to the top, I'd love to be doing what you're doing. And he said, my God, you got a lot of guts, don't you? Or nerve, he said. I said, normally, no, I can be polite, uh, you know, at my own expense. But I said, I'm not going to let the moment go by uh, uh, after you said something so nice. So he said, you totally busted me. He said, I'm going to listen to your demo. And he said, I think we'll be seeing each other again. Well, he called me in less than a week later for a, a small part, peripheral part in another show. Uh, he called me in again after that. He called me in to read for uh, A.B. Sitter. He knew that I did that. It was related to something that I did in another show. Uh, in that same cluster of first uh, appearances. This happened in my real life, okay? He introduced me to the room. Uh, I, was, I was invited into the cast of what they were calling the New Jetsons at that time. And, uh, you know, in walks Don Messick, in walks June Ferre, Janet Waldo, all these people that average people may not know their names, but my God, to me, they were luminaries and legends. He, uh, he says, uh, I want you all to meet Greg Berger. I saw him on stage. I think he's one of the new kids. I want you to welcome him. He's where he's supposed to be. Then he took me aside and he said, uh, I'm going to seat you next to Mel Blank because that's where you belong. 
and uh, that happened in my real life. And Mel fell asleep uh, during the session, and I was there and saw Gordon Hunt try to wake Mel up and said from the booth, he said, Mel, Mel, Mel. And I saw Mel Blank wake up as Mr. Spacely. He went from... <laughs> And he woke up like this. Jetson! <laughs> it doesn't get any better. I could have died that day so happy. Thankfully, I didn't. But it was like everything, everything was, was it was a perfect storm. It was a magical moment. Uh, and everything about Fantastic Max was equally magical. To walk through those halls at Hanna-Barbera and feel the ghosts in the building and the creativity in the building and you have to walk past uh, artists to get to the recording studio and writers, and it's all designed. And uh, Klasky Chupa was modeled the exact same way. It's almost a labyrinth to get to the uh, voice record studio. But in the process of getting there, you're immersed in the collaboration that every voice performer and artist and writer should experience, which is that mishmash of everybody so dependent on everybody else that's how it happens if you don't honor the words if you don't honor the artists you know if you think you're like all that because you because you're voicing a character you, you're missing the whole experience but if you honor the the writer and honor the artist and realize that you're supplying a third dimension to the character geez god it's 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 a very beautiful way to spend uh, a lifetime career awesome and um, Chris, I asked two questions. So, you know, uh, you get to ask two straight questions, man. I know we usually do patterns, but you get, you will ask two straight questions. All right. It's like, um, it's like playing hopscotch. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, what were some of your memories uh, working on G.I. Joe back in the 80s? Well, uh, it was, I thought uh, the danger is you start to think it'll always be that way. So I was doing Transformers and G.I. Joe at the same time, two massive projects. You had to have an agent because to act like kind of an air traffic controller just to be where you needed to be at the time you needed to be there. It was so whirlwind busy that it was, uh, in, in my head, it was like being a radio actor in New York in the golden age of radio because uh, people I've worked with along the way, including Howie Morris, said in those days... You, you would just run past cabs or try to get to the next studio. Everything was live and everything was happening and you were always late for something else. But I was so busy that uh, um, you have to learn if you want a career to sort of be a squirrel along the way and realize it's not always busy like that. And you got to maximize your availability and, and everything else. But uh we didn't know, we couldn't know, no one can know that, uh, that what you're doing is going to have the longevity that those two shows had. And again, you know, I've been blessed in more recent years with convention appearances literally around the world and meeting uh, career military who owe all of their original, what lit the fire was their GI Joe involvement. Those PSAs went on to have a life of their own. Uh, Spirit is probably the closest of any character I've ever done to my own worldview. Even though he's Native American, he believes that possibility and impossibility are states of mind. In my mind, there is only the possible, that which can be done. Down freedom. <laughs> uh, so I got, to, I got to step into some phenomenal opportunities um i was doing a show called the littles uh for wally burr who also saw me when i went on in cloud nine and also said whoa he said uh he said frank little your role in the littles is pretty close to your neutral self he said but i am in the process of working on two gigantic uh series shows he said and i'm going to keep you in mind for everything because of what i just saw so my first love stage has has 
a lot kind of catapulted me in in the eyes of of two people that were very significant casting wise and director wise in in my life and i bowed down to both of them every time i saw them for the for the rest of their lives um so wally wally burr had a situ had a setup that would honor the actor and he would leave like a whole table full of scripts out when you came in and he would say pick three that you think show you the best so he was he was not screening the actor he was having the actors screen themselves so we would all you know sift through all this material and pick whatever we thought was best for us well that's that that's like an incredible nod to the actor from the director he's not trying to like pre-assign you anything now in transformers <laughs> he called me up and he said uh he said i got good news and a question i said what's up and he said uh, they love you for grimlock he said but are you going to be able to maintain and sustain that voice it's a it's a tonsil buster and i said put me in coach i'll 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 we'll make it work i'll I'll be there uh, 150% every time. So when I read for Grimlock, I actually, at the outset, I restrained my jaw. I hinged my own face. Um, and I just came from that uh, big muscle, small brain outlook. And, and that's how that was born. All, all of these things were intertwined. And G.I. Joe, I was... Uh, Firefly, just because it was so much fun to blow stuff up. And uh, Spirit, who's the exact opposite, and Zen. Keone Young, who was Storm Shadow, and I have been friends forever. Um, and um, Cutter, who was always off to the island of no return. And uh, um, Ripcord, just because it was so much fun to jump out of planes all the time. Anyway, we fought, uh, we fought the good fight. Uh, and over time, and when I meet people who were so uh, influenced by just those shows, one guy introduced me, he said, these shows are the reason I was late for school when they were on in the morning and tried to cut my last class when they were on in the afternoon. <laughs> it's, it, you know, it, it, it makes you part of this, uh, this pop culture cornerstone uh, it's it's i i don't undervalue it i don't write it off i don't shrug it off i get that it's important uh to people and i know that it's important to me but i i can't even tell you how this uh comic-con life uh culture has turned me around because not only do people get the chance and take the opportunity to come and say thank you or whatever it, it gives me the chance to say thank you like one-on-one -on -one and that's that's how I do that so that's 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 what I want to do so there's paying it back and paying it forward and paying it sideways and it it's all good it's so just so good all right a little cool uh me and Peter are also fans of uh, Garfield and Friends which yeah means, uh, me too oh yeah <laughs> uh, uh what are your memories uh working on that show as Odie Floyd and Orson Pig well, Floyd became Squeak the Mouse in the later years. Uh, Squeak the Mouse is on Garfield, uh, the Garfield show. Floyd, who's basically the same mouse in a different incarnation, is, uh, is on Garfield and Friends. But uh, I, I love the Garfield and I love the and Friends because Orson is also about as close to my neutral self as, as anything could be. Uh, Except for the, that my brothers were always just around the corner and trying to beat the ham out of me. Um, yeah, plus, I had to talk Wade down from every ledge there was. Um, but the Garfield and Friends episodes and the guests that we had in and the specials, it, it was kind of just a, a, a consuming interest. So again you're you're in iconic land there was a there was a magazine article just specifically talking about garfield and saying that it was one of the few shows when they do polls that would poll people couldn't remember 
if it was classic or contemporary because they kind of feel like it was around since Mickey Mouse, but of course it wasn't. It just, once it hit the air, um, it was as though it had always been there. I know the, the strip was a lot, around a lot longer than the show, but Jim Davis was very hands-on. I ended up being an honored guest in Muncie, Indiana, where, where Jim draws the, the cartoon strip. And Mark Evanier, the, the animation director and writer of the Saturday show, uh, and I uh, spent time together in Muncie. Uh, Jim Davis created a just premier uh, animation studio uh, uh, um, where the strip is drawn. He, he attracted um, really like world-class cartoonists from all over the world who ended up raising their families in Muncie, Indiana, because Jim, to his credit, is quoted as saying, the world is only really funny from Muncie, Indiana. He said, if I move to Washington, D.C. Or, or Hollywood or New York, it's just, it's not as funny. You got to be in the middle of the middle to really get just how deliciously uh, funny the world is. And that's the Arbuckle philosophy that, and, and that's the U.S. Acres is called Orson's Farm in the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, but uh, I had occasion to fly, where was I? Oh, I, I, I was in Hong Kong and I got off the plane and I walked into the airport and in the first gift shop, I saw Garfield stuff all over the place. And I thought, holy cow. You know, this, this is global. This is everywhere as, as successful animation always is. And, and it just blew my mind. Uh, um, I saw an episode of Transformers dubbed into Chinese in Hong Kong in my hotel room. That was a mind blower also. Crazy. Cool. And uh, before I ask my uh, next question, uh, Mr. Berger, let me just say that, you know, longtime fan of your work, like especially on Garf uh, Garfield and Friends. And before we had the dynamic duo of Greg Berger and Jason Alexander, we had a totally <laughs> funny trio of Greg Berger, uh, the late great uh, Lorenzo Music, and Tom Hughes. What were your memories working with Tom and Lorenzo? Well, I mean, we it was family. We were family. Uh and just like Duckman and Cornfed, uh, Garfield and Odie, it's a buddy comedy. It's a buddy comedy like Hope and Crosby, uh, like Abbott and Costello. It's just in Garfield and Odie, you have one member, one, one of the buddies in the buddy comedy is restrained to barking, slurping, and emoting, which I did all of. But uh, these th those kind of relationships in animation kind of bond you uh as as family anyway you gotta you gotta jump on the same ripple of the same pond get the same joke in order for it all to make sense and tom was was just phenomenal he was he he was a perfect foil he was he as john arbuckle he was more of the straight man for for whatever the situation was um and he was Binky the Clown on, on U.S. Acres. <laughs> hey, kids! Uh, so we just, it was, it was madness. We, we were all uh, there to serve the peace. But, but uh, you know, we, the, the, the scripts were so good that you don't want to embellish. But by the same token, we were not only allowed but encouraged to do whatever it took to keep it spontaneous and keep it stupid and silly and fun and funny and loving and all of those things. And I believe that that comes through. And I believe that's why every two to four years, a new generation discovers the show, young people I'm talking about. Uh, um, and they, and they embrace it all over again. Actually, to some degree that that happens with transformers as well. We keep, we keep getting new generations uh, who discover the show. Even if they come in through a different incarnation of Transformers, 
somehow they seem to find their way back to G1 and the and the 86 feature, and uh, they make it they make it theirs. It is kind of a beautiful thing. I think it's a beautiful thing. Awesome. Uh, oh, Chris, before you uh, ask this qu uh, question, um, I just gotta ask, uh, Mr. Berger, um, would you say that the uh, chemistry between Roy and Orson was like a precursor to the chemistry of Duckman and Cornfed? That's we let's do a doctoral thesis. That's pretty good stuff. <laughs> and uh, it, it's not unlike, you know, uh, um, I was hired as Cornfed before they had nailed down a duck man uh and we did a pilot uh and i was there for all of the readings of people and some really luminary people but jason just took it grabbed it and chewed it up and made it his own and uh you know we've actually parodied the sort of hope and crosby stuff we had some musical adventures we had the road to oh we did we didn't do the road to uh whatever the road pictures are with hope and crosby ours was the road to dendron so <laughs> and we had we had songs and and actually did homage to hope and crosby and the whole paramount buddy comedy stuff um but sure uh sure those those relationships are parallel i don't know if i would realize that that that, that they would uh, pay off as being similar dynamics but they definitely uh, it's the same chemistry experiment in both i see that's pretty cool you're first of all you guys have done an extraordinary amount of homework and you seem to be archivists and and uh, collectors of of all of the eclectic best of everything uh, i'm very impressed like this one sir you just yeah kind of fine. yeah kind of like that <laughs> um, well, so, somebody had to take care of the duck I know, right? <laughs> uh, exactly. And they gave me this stingy brimmed hat and skinny tie. I mean, it doesn't get any better. In the first drawing of corn fed I ever saw, I'm getting closer to the mic. That's why I'm going out of frame. Greg? Uh, it said just the facts, ma'am. Greg, there is nobody that can do Joe Friday like you can, sir. That is a <laughs> fact. That is a 100% fact. There's nobody that can do Joe Friday like you. Well, it does work close, and it does work better when it works close. So <laughs> awesome. Uh, Chris, uh, next question. Uh, hmm. Being that are also a uh, longtime fans of The Simpsons, which has been on running for 32 seasons, uh, what have been some of your moments for you working at in this series? Well, uh, it's pretty fantastic that uh, I've been allowed to put on the Sideshow Bob costume when Kelsey Grammer's not available and he's very rarely ava available uh, because of other commitments. So I've done table reads and records as Sideshow Bob. He comes in later, it's his part, you know? And this is the first time I think I've done, uh, sort of picked up the crumbs of somebody else's character because of availability. But um, in one of the Criterion uh versions of the simpsons that was released uh the producers are saying that uh that they that when kelsey wasn't available that i was there to cover do all of the cover for for sideshow bob um but um a, well nancy nancy uh was on uh fantastic max with me so you keep running into the same people all through the course of a career. You keep butting heads over and over and over again, but but I never forgot that original association and neither did she. Those tables are so ridiculously creative and, and overflowing with uh, uh, just, the, the, the original table read rooms are packed with people and guests and things and you get a script that is so perfect and because they have the budget and the writers and the talent and the skill to uh take what you assume at the first read to be a perfect script and every day you get revisions and you watch this diamond get polished over and over and over again and and the writers are laughing uh at the at the table read but they're they're sc madly scribbling notes because just like in school, when you write a paper and turn it in, you could probably write a better paper 
immediately after you turned that paper in because of all you learned from the paper. Well, they were kind, they're kind of like that with uh, taking something that's brilliant from the get-go and making it better and better and better and funnier and more topical and more interesting. And, and you see the way they inject stuff through the course of the week between the table read and the record. And it's just uh, a jaw dropping how, how good they are. And they take perfect and then assume they can do better. And then they do better. And uh, it's just, uh, it's inspiring. It's inspiring to be part of it. It's inspiring to watch how it's done. And obviously I have uh, a world of respect for the cast and uh, presumably they for me, cause it's always old home week when I get called in and, and uh, it's good. And the parties are crazy and great. And the uh, occasional gifts are amazing. And it's a, it's a very nice thing to, uh, to have in my portfolio, I'll say. Awesome. And one of mine and Chris's favorite works, we had, uh, last week we had David Eccles on the show who voiced Crumb and a uh, great guy. And we were talking, and he, he talked about how much he loved working with the cast, like working with you, Charlie, the late great Christine Cavanaugh. Um, I want to get your memories on working on Avril Monsters as the Grumble and was the Grumble's voice an inspiration of the Blue, uh, Blue Meanies from the Beatles? I think he's, you can't say he's not influenced by it. Uh, but the thing is, I mean, it comes from the red pumps. It comes from the desire to teach and the slight anger management problem when there's pusillanimous pieces of pond scum passing themselves off as monsters. When we all know that if you, you have a perfect world, there's no need to speak up or speak louder. And yet they just won't listen. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> this still, all this takes me back. There, like, there were there were times the, the in those days the record booth at Klasky Chupa was very small. Phenomenal, but when we had scenes together, we almost stacked up on top of each other's shoulders and jumped in when we needed to, and then we did some things in isolation. David, I'm sure he told you, is is just an astonishing uh, sound mixer, sound editor. He, he's, a, he's quite the eclectic uh, master of, of many trades, but he, he's, he's a really, really skilled and talented guy. Um, we loved each other. I, first of all, I bond really easily, but uh, when, when you're in uh, that kind of codependent world where where all the cues are coming at breakneck speed and everybody is dependent on each other, it, it attracts a certain kind of person. Now that's all under the shepherding of the producers and directors and, you know, it doesn't just happen. They're, 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 um, they're trying to put a, a, a winning team together, like a baseball team, like an orchestra. There's different instruments in the orchestra, but they're all dependent on each other. And if the, uh, if everybody takes the process seriously and they put the right group of people together, then that becomes its own organism. That's part of what makes the show appealing is, is that combination of people, combination of voices, combination of dynamics. And that's where it comes from. That's why some things get remembered and other things don't. I mean that that that's my philosophy. That's that's how I see it. I understand, uh, Chris. Uh, what was your next question, Chris? Uh, when you voiced the Grumble, there was a line in that you would say occasionally, "Burgaluga Mongolime." Was that gibberish, or was there an inside joke behind that phrase? There's no inside joke behind it, but uh, I mean, you'd have to ask the writer. I I said what they wrote. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you, you just have to make it uh, uh, some kind of explosive thing like anything else. But it, it had no meaning beyond whatever meaning it had to the writer. I never really asked, and I probably should have. Oh. But it's quite an exclamation. 
<laughs> now, um, did you have a favorite episode or a favorite Guambo line that you recorded? Uh, it, I mean, it's really hard to beat pusillanimous pieces of pond scum. That's that's pretty darn good. Um, I I love the Halloween episode and and uh, how to scare humans and, and oh and just philosophy on how humans work. Um, you know, it, it's almost like it's it's parallel to the whole Monsters University kind of storyline. Um, it was practically the precursor. Yeah, I, I I mean I think that's kind of the same structure. So so you know I t I take it I take it not seriously and I take it seriously. I take it as as a teacher who cares about whether his students get it. Um, and I and I factor the anger management aspect into that, um, but but uh, I mean a good teacher has love for his students and loves when they succeed and gets very frustrated when they don't, and you know they're like the three stooges that that are are the bane of my existence. So if you add, I I here's the thing, it's silly. And it's stupid, and it's smart, and it's funny, and it's touching. It's it's a little bit of everything, if you're doing it right. Um, so, I I, uh, I I I just I think some people have the uh, misinformation along the way. They think it's just a bunch of funny voices to picture. But it's voice acting, and if you don't, if you don't really have the chops, and if you don't really focus on the acting, then you don't create characters that people care about. Well, if you don't create characters that people care about, then nobody cares what happens to those characters. I'm not trying to get it all heavy or touchy feely. I'm just saying that's the gig, and that's part of why you remember certain voice actors and others maybe not so much the the more you you realize that you're being tasked with breathing life into a character you know they're not looking for funny voices in the casting aspect of it they're looking for characters so the more homework you do the more you really try to find that third dimension and make it live make it breathe the more likely it's going to be remembered so when i teach which I do on occasion, or coach, uh, which I enjoy doing. Uh, I, I say this is going to sound oversimplified, but if you want to be remembered, be memorable. You know that has to do with the voice, but it has more to do with uh, if you're if you're if you're finding the truth in a character, the voice will follow. Uh, that's why you know Frank Welker, me, a lot of people that have been doing it for a long, 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 long time tend not to you don't forget the characters you've created because you did the work you know who they are you know how they breathe you know how they respond to situations so you remember them like you remember you know a character that you saw in a movie you remember what's memorable about them i see and uh, uh, chris before you uh ask the next question let me just say that you are not only memorable uh, mr Berger, but you are i mean i consider you a voice acting legend you mentioned in uh uh, Mel, uh, Mel Blanks and Don Messick. I mean, I, I would put you like, you know, in the category of voice acting legends too. I mean, I mean, for all those memories you've given like myself and Chris growing up, I mean, you know, watching Iron Monster, the Duckman, or, or even, you know, uh, Garfield, a Garfield friend and Transformers, you're definitely earned the title legend. Thanks, ma'am. That is high praise indeed. And uh, as I was jaw droppingly uh, uh, just stopped in my tracks as i'm as i have met these people along the way and james earl jones and don knotts and holy cow the company i've been in carol channing and oh it just a, a world of a world i was there at transformers the day orson wells pulled up to do unicron um it just i realized that if if uh if somebody some says that about me uh it makes it all feel Full circle. So I thank you. That's really, uh, that means the world to me.
anytime. And you know what? You're the only person aside from the Beatles Blue Meanie. You're the only <laughs> that in, that innovated, you know, switching between mass uh, feminine and masculine. Like I remember the episode of Our Monsters Clockwise, where you give uh, Agrambo gives Ickis the time the, the watch to, that stops time or turns yeah. back time, and then you're like, it's not a gift, it's a punishment. <laughs> Yeah. And the, there's only one person I know that did that, but that was later on, and that's Tom Kane. When he did the character, him on Powerpuff Girls. I oh, get reminded, beautiful. Yep. I get reminded every single time of Greg Berger, because he, yeah. <laughs> he delivered a line where, like, he says, as him, he goes, you see, I've taken all of that love for you, and I turn it into hate. <laughs> <laughs> um, do the... Do these pumps make me look fat? No, really. Do no, don't tell me. No, no, do no, don't no, do. Oh, this is awesome. Um, Christopher, next question. Well, I mean, this is actually more of an adage to like what we were just talking about. But as a kid, I actually just you know, was both very glad, but also kind of sad that I didn't have the grumble as my teacher because they were terrifying and uh, hilariously awesome at the same time thanks that's great i like that awesome look out for monsters under your bed by the way <laughs> oh that's where we hide <laughs> oh this takes me back <laughs> me too that's uh, awesome all right. Uh, you also voiced uh, Mysterio and Craven the Hunter in the 1994 Spider-Man series, which uh, me and Pete both remember fondly. Uh, what are some of your memories working on that show? Uh, memory number one, memory number uno, m number uh, importanto is that uh, Stan Lee at that time said that he felt that what we were doing under the uh, under the guidance of John, oh my God, his name just popped out of my head, uh, but it'll it'll come back. He's a great friend. Um, that that was the closest to the way he pictured Spider-Man being animated, uh, the character voices, the animation, every aspect of it. He found very pleasing. Well, that I mean that that means everything to me. And I had the great good fortune of meeting him in green rooms at, at conventions along the way. And I told him that I had the great good fortune of voicing Craven the Hunter and Mysterio, Quentin Beck, master of special effects and treachery. And uh, he said, oh, I love that show. Uh, I said, well, you're kind of the creator um, at any rate. Uh, it, it's it's all good and um they're just they're just massively draw, well drawn villains but the fun part of playing villains bad guys in general is they never perceive themselves as the bad guys it's just they're doing they're they're doing what their destiny is which is sometimes to take over the world or Sometimes to mount Spider-Man on the wall as my trophy, because the most dangerous game is man. Phenomenal. All that and a big fur uh, collar and, and uh, the baddest of the bad. It's more fun to play bad guys. There's more scenery to chew, you know. How bad do I have to be? <laughs> awesome. And um, I do want to get your memories, too, on working on, because I watched this as a kid growing up. Uh, there used to be a show on Cartoon Network called What Are Cartoons? And one of the segments on the show was Podunk Possum. That's uh, right. In uh, uh, One Step Beyond, where you played a federal agent. We're federal agents, sir. Look at the shiny badge, Mr. Possum. And then, <laughs> and then you also played the police, uh, the chief of police at the end. Um, what were your memories doing in that segment? Before we go any further, John Semper was at the helm of Spider-Man the Animated Series. He's been a friend for life. I just had a momentary senior moment and his name went out of my head. Of course, I know John Semper. Uh, but uh, at the, in those days at Hanna-Barbera, they were, they were trying to reward new animators, uh, new, new people that had uh, um, ideas that had never 
been animated, but they deemed them worthy. So that What a Cartoon was a way to short form uh, put things into production that they wanted to see what they looked like. Uh, I thought Podunk Possum was f uh, very, very uh, credible and, and should have gone on uh, and had a life of its own. Um, but we felt like we were all part of, of this. It was almost like doing experimental theater or, or pitching, uh, uh, doing, doing a pitch of a new show. Um, it was very creative and a lot of the, a lot of the creative people had come out of uh, Cal Arts or other places that were kind of prestige animation schools. And this was their reward. Uh, Hanna-Barbera was rewarding their efforts and uh, uh, with the intention of picking the best of the best, like, like Top Chef or something uh, and, and uh, taking people into their employ based on how, how successful things scan. But uh, sure, I, there, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no cop gumshoe to detective to Agent K. You, you, you just uh, hand it to me and, and watch me run. Cool. Uh, Agent, Agent K said, shoot him, Jay. He's a cerebral feckaloid. The brains are in their bottoms. You know where to aim. <laughs> Well, speaking of Agent K, that was actually going to be my next question. And uh, what were some of your memories playing him in the Men in Black TV series through, from the second to fourth seasons? Yeah, uh, well, apparently you do remember. I was going to say, I don't know if you remember, but I came in uh, after season one. I never asked. I'm not certain why they made the casting change. They asked me to, they said, we want it to be your own, but, uh, but we're, we're kind of going in homage to to the films and uh so i uh i i i took that as my cue um i thought the writing was splendid uh, i thought we wound up on kind of a, a cliffhanger i thought there would be another season uh but they had you know they had people like david warner in and they had they had i i thought Honest to God, that that most of those twenty-two minute episodes could have been fleshed into a ninety-minute animated feature. I I thought the stories were so good that I hated to see them resolve. And then later in the series, we had things that sort of had a thread that went on. We had we had episodes that had arcs um, with continuing story. So that that was exactly the way I sort of read it from the get go. I thought these are really good, troubling, uh, compelling kind of plot lines. And I, 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 I believe that any of them could have been expandable, which is really a high compliment for the writers. Yeah, it's definitely a shame that uh, it didn't last beyond uh, where it ended because, yeah, there's so much they could have worked with. I also often think that a sense like uh, uh, the, uh, you know, tabloid magazines like the national Enquirer, for instance it could be seen as like hidden lore within the men in black universe <laughs> that could just be easily used as, as some unused storylines that have yet to be fleshed out absolutely bat boy found in cave <laughs> um i do want to ask you and this is I, I waited a long time to ask you this question, sir. And these are questions related to one of my favorite shows and Christopher's favorite show of all time, Duck Man. Uh, Boom. What were your memories uh, working on the set? I mean, I had Pat Music, uh, your co-star, Pat Music on the show la uh, two months ago. Uh, awesome person, you know, discussed Duck Man. Now I, I want to get your memories on working on Duck Man. Well, I love Pat. Uh, I love everyone in that cast, from Tim Curry to Jason to Dweezil, uh, Nancy Travis. My, oh my God, it was it was a love fest. Um, but see, my my most prominent memory of that show has to do with actually uh, Police Academy Mission to Moscow. Because in season one of Duckman, I got cast uh, as Yuri Talinsky, Russian agent in the Police Academy Mission to Moscow. So I got flown to Moscow. Uh, everything, record, everything was shot on location. And Klasky Chupo 
gave me permission to go and they gave me this condenser mic a really really high quality tape recorder condenser mic and sent me uh to russia with it and the jeff reno and ron osborne the the uh, producer writers would call me in my hotel room in in moscow and uh sort of feed me the lines they would fax me the script they would direct me by phone. I would record into the condenser mic and, and um, slate everything so that they could cut it in. They said the quality of what I sent was so good that if I had not been able to return on time to revoice everything, that they actually could have gone to broadcast with what I was recording from my hotel room in Moscow. So I really was two places at one time. I was recording from 9,000 miles away, sending it uh, overnight or over overnight uh, back to Los Angeles where a courier was picking up the FedEx, running it to production. They were cutting it into the show so that the animators could stay on time. But I literally was two places at one time. Then uh, the other prominent memory because of Jason Seinfeld shooting schedule is w when I got back, when we did do episodes together, we would, we would record on Sundays, we'd record at 11 o'clock at night, we'd record whenever it was that he was available, at, but, but everything kept production on schedule. So those are all sort of behind the scenes things that have nothing to do with the final product. I, I, I hold that show up high. I think that writing is so smart. And when they released the uh, box set, they asked me to come back in. They had uh, Everett Peck and I watch the pilot episode together, kind of Criterion style with a, with a commentary. Um, but, but man, my heart belongs to Duckman. And I, the same as Our Real Monsters, I believe that if enough uh, um, effort got behind it, I think both of those shows have since since adult swim and other other things like adult swim have come to hit the air i i feel like both of those shows have so much life left in them because they're just so freaking and creative uh and funny and smart and I, my whole my whole deal the trifecta is funny smart and stupid but you, it's got to be stupid that's written by smart people in order like simpsons in order to to sort of elevate the humor of it um so it's, oh uh the other thing about duckman is is jeff reno and rob ron osborne told me they said we're trying to create they had just come off of moonlighting which is the same kind of thing they said we're trying to create a smorgasbord show we want to shove so much content into 22 minutes that you can't eat it all in one sitting you have to go back and watch it again to to see what you missed we want it to be like breakneck speed and that's what they did it's just crammed okay nice cool what was your uh, favorite corn fed line or episode of duck and recorded well i did like the fact that we wanted to be the first in in the yellow pages we wanted to be the first person people you thought about so we in haunted society plumbers we became the guys from a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a plumbing she says you're the gentleman from a a a a and it go it's probably the first 10 minutes of the show that's right. That's right. We're the guys from A A A A A. Oh, Greg, uh, you're taking me back. <laughs> oh, this is definitely gonna take you back, then, because one of my favorite lines was the episode well, from the episode Psych, where like Cor uh, Corporate goes, "Duckman, we need to go to this. You know, I need to have this inner beast inside me. Tug it at me. Yell and take me, Corporate. Make me your love slave." You know that sort of thing. Yes, <laughs> we got a, we got away with everything. It was phenomenal. And you again, you know, you you're allowed and encouraged uh, to make it your own, but the words are so good that you don't really want to mess with it. Oh. And and Jason was uh, he just he, he's he's Duckman. 
I would love to do more. Hopefully it'll find its way somewhere, somehow. Because there's there's more cases in the case book. I, I, stay in, I stay in touch with Ron and Jeff. I stay in touch with Everett Peck. I see Jason on occasion. Uh, I did a, a, a an old-time radio uh, re thing with Nancy Travis. I, 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 I bump into people along the way. You know, it's great. Great, great, great. Awesome. And I do want to get your uh, memories, of course. I asked this question to Pat Music when she was on the show, and I want to ask you this because you worked with her uh, too, um, the person I'm about to name, but uh, what were your memories working with the late, great Dana Hill? Well, you know, she, she's, she's Dana Hill. She's, she's one of a kind. She's one of the sweetest uh, uh, actors, but also people uh, uh, just gigantic heart massive talent uh one of a kind nobody sounded like that nobody looked like that and and uh i just uh, i've had that experience time after time after time uh in transformers when scatman brought his ukulele nobody wanted to go back to work dana is dana uh and and um just with each passing day I realized that it's it's the one of a kinds. It's the people that there's nobody in the wings for, you know. That's what you want to collect in your life. There's a there's a lot of vanilla in the world, and there aren't that many really, really, really distinctive people. But she's she's one of them. She was she was a very good friend, and uh, she kept she 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 would hang out with with uh, oh shoot, what's his name? <laughs> Oh, never mind. I mean, I, I'll pass on that. But but uh, she she was just a joy. She was she, you know you could you could feel a little light around her, um, and uh, that was her. I understand. I mean, there was two uh, vo voice actors and actresses. I grew. I mean, well, well, growing up watching when they when I found out they passed away, I just cried. I I just couldn't stop crying. Uh, Dana yeah. was one of them. Yeah. And of course, the late great Phil Hartman was another one that when I found out about his past, and I was crying for days, like just like Dana Hill. Too soon, terrible circumstances. Phil was a friend. We were groundlings together. I believe that we auditioned for the groundlings on the same night, the, the first time we were in the theater. <clears throat> but but we, we did a lot of stuff together, and I bumped into him on The Simpsons, and you know, again, I, it's it's not right when these lights go out too soon. Uh, it's it's uh, it's rough. It is. But but uh, but you then you're left with gratitude for for what they left. You get what you get, you know. And they they both rose to, uh, you know, and so many others, and they they rose to uh, to find their audience, and that's a big deal in this life. It's it's it's. Uh, I guess it's if that's what you seek to do, it's nice when you're allowed to do it. I see. But I'm sorry? You, you, you can't imagine how many good people find themselves in this line of work. Um, and I, I, I enjoy them. And there's, there's way more good, good ones than bad ones. I hold on to the good ones. <laughs> I love it. And uh, Chris, before you ask uh, the question, because this uh, Christopher has a question he's been dying to ask, like he's been telling me he wants to ask this question for the longest time. Before before you do, Chris, and you can have uh, two questions. Uh, it's only fair because I'm going to ask one more question uh, to Mr. Berger before you uh, ask your question. And that is, um, I love the meta re reference you did in one episode where you portrayed a drunk uh, corn fed in a live action of Duckman's movie. Um, yeah. What were your memories doing in that particular scene? Well, I mean, this is Duckman casting his own live action. So, of course, he makes Cornfed a stumble bum, fall down drunk. <laughs> and he gave me, it looked like I'd been sleeping in the gutter, uh, this filthy suit that I was wearing, and I hadn't shaved for a while. <laughs> Duckman, there's a woman outside to see you. Uh, and uh, Charlie Shaughnessy played Duckman because Charlie's dapper and Duckman was going to cast himself as the most dapper <laughs> sleuth in the business. Everything about it was so off that it was on 
plus just the idea of doing it all live action it, it was it, it was magical i i i i adored it awesome <laughs> all right. warm as 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 you still got it greg you still got it sir you still got it yeah i i can't get rid of it <laughs> it's stuck it's stuck hey hopefully you never lose it here here awesome yeah the work you did uh, which was a hidden gem for both me and pete was a claymation sitcom by Will Vinton Studios back in 2001 called Gary and Mike. What yeah. Are some, what are some of your memories or, yeah, that you have uh, working on that show? You know, I, I, I'm not sure that anything that I did made it to air. I, I know I read for that way back in the early, early, but um, maybe IMDb misplaced something. I don't, I don't think I was on air in Gary and Mike. I read for it at the early, early, but I don't know. You'd have to refresh my memory. I don't. I don't think oh. I'm cut it, cut into any of the episodes. Oh, he's he's gonna do that right now. <laughs> do it. Do it. All right. And so this is actually one episode where Gary and Mike are at a fish concert, and Mike ends up getting captured by a, like uh, these suits who are like the men in charge of running the concert. And he finds out the secret evil behind Fish's unwarranted success. <laughs> <laughs> and right here, the man in charge gives us like a whole big soliloquy, that, which is voiced by you, sir. Okay. I, I, I'm going to take your word for it. I, I, if I did it and, and it got cut in, then, then I, I was unaware of that. So thank you. You know more about me than I know about me. <laughs> I do right. know... I do know this, Fish's success is not unwarranted. <laughs> hey, hopefully not, right? Right. Sorry, I, I wish I could I wish I could help. I got I got nothing. <laughs> well, right. And so in this part you voiced it with your corn fed voice if uh, I could actually uh, put it in that category right there. Right. Uh, Friday. <laughs> You look out there, you see a muddy field, a rickety stage, a woefully insufficient number of porta potties, and a marginally <laughs> talented jam band mailing in yet another performance. Do you have any idea what it takes to create something that looks this half assed and smells this bad? <laughs> Billions. I and hope I did it. it. <laughs> That's <laughs> fantastic. And do you know what it takes to bring it all come crashing down? One scrawny little non paying son of a bitch like you! And we will not have it, Mr. Bonner! Any questions? Oh, this takes me back. That's awesome. Oh, uh, one thing about you, uh, Greg, we love, we absolutely love about you is how you completely emote. Like when you're like doing a uh, character or you're doing like a, a role, it doesn't feel like you're reading the script. It comes all natural. Like you have that natural charisma, man. That's the whole idea. That's the, that's the joy of it, you know? That's, that's how I want to be remembered. I appreciate that. I, I, I remember watching that scene like, that Chris just shared, and I, I remember you actually made me sweaty. Like, when you did that uh, scene, Greg, I was actually tensing up. I was getting sweaty because of how real it, it came off. It came off, like, surreal. <laughs> <laughs> um. Another show you worked on, of course, and I'll remember to this day, because um, you were in both episodes. I mean, you've done numerous voices on the show, but I remember this one in particular because it was one of my first episodes of Rugrats I watched. And that was uh, your memory working on, of course, Rugrats, because I remember you played the plumber in Down the Drain, and you were also the minister in um, uh, 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 Let Them Have Cake. Whenever, whenever they called, I answered. I did the Rugrats movie, too. Uh, as the voice of the Monkey Brothers Circus, uh, but but that Klasky Chupo gang, uh, wherever it was, uh, Thornberries, whatever they were doing, uh, it's almost like it's almost like all the shows had the same. Uh, I don't know. There's there's just a level of artist that was attracted to those shows, and that those shows attracted. But you know, uh, it's 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 like being uh, part of part of a, a very impressive club to be on Rugrats, 
uh, just like it was for uh, for Clone Wars or Star Wars. There's certain things that that really have a, a kind of an elevated status to being a part of. So, um, yeah, you know, I love those people. I, uh, I I'm friends with most of the cast. The voice community in general is is uh, well, it's larger than it used to be, but it used to be a pretty select group of people, and we would see each other over and over and over and over again. So everything is a labor of love, and you're always uh, feel like you're at home when you're in session with those people. Awesome, and. <clears throat> Christopher, I'm sorry I didn't get let, let you have the two questions though, but this time these next two questions are for you. And uh, before we, before you ask the question, just want to say, uh, Mr. Berger, you have done as much as you've done for voice acting and animation. You have done a lot for video games. And right. where I'm getting at that is that uh, Christopher, floor is yours, sir. So get into video games. What are some of your memories do, uh, voicing the pain in Metal Gear Solid 3? And favorite lines? Mies! Uh, my, my memory is uh, that it was explained to me that Metal Gear was reaching a point where it could no longer be called a game because they were becoming interactive experiences. I just stopped myself from sneezing, thankfully. Um, there, it's, 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 uh, windy in Southern California and there's so much pollen in the air that, uh, that allergies are, are, uh, wide awake. However, uh, and that's exactly how it felt. All the bosses, all the, all the pursuit in those days, I know, I know that, uh, Video game production, it, it just, the graphics become astonishingly better and better and better, even when you think they can't. But when I was shown footage from uh, Metal Gear 3, I thought, holy cow, it, it really is kind of an immersive experience. And I, just, I thought it was extraordinary visually. Now, if it falls to me to, to do any driving game, I'm, I'm driving over a bridge in 30 seconds. I'm a very bad video game player, but uh, interactive game player. But um, I, I, I love being part of the experience. I love watching people who know what they're doing, navigate the uh, experience, the game, the whatever. Uh, and and I, uh, I, think, I think the pain is a big baddie. And I, I loved it. Can I just say too, uh, Chris, before you ask a question, that it took me ten tries to beat your character, Greg. <laughs> I couldn't beat the pain. It took me ten tries. It's not easy to beat the pain. No. <laughs> good, I mind, good for you for trying, though. <laughs> I suppose on my end, I sort of just like I had to know the pattern, as it were, because it was like one of those the things that uh, as soon as you like see the like wall of bees it, that's when you're not supposed to throw the grenades because then the bees will catch them and, and drop them back at you uh, and yeah. you also just gotta like know when to uh, get into cover we uh, shout tommy gun know when to hold them know when to fold them uh that the thing of the the other thing that should be said about interactive game voicing though is uh it's almost always done kind of in a vacuum. The relationship is between the director on the other side of the glass and the actor in the booth, and they have to kind of paint you into scenes because you're recording in isolation because there's so many, essentially almost infinite number of choices that are all player driven. You have to cover everything. And because you have to cover everything, uh, they kind of have to paint you into scenes. Sometimes you're the first person in and you listen through your headphones and there's nothing there. So you're, you're creating a scene, even though the other members of the scene aren't in it yet. Uh, it's much more preferred to be the last guy in because then you hear it all around you and you're kind of in the moment and you're just interacting. Um, but you kind of have to have that ability to be the first piece of the jigsaw puzzle if you're going to do interactive gaming and that's a really really trusted relationship between the actor and the director because they got to sort of 
guide you to whatever levels of intensity it needs to be. Um, so I like doing it, but it, it's kind of a disjointed feeling. And there's a joke that you can always tell the game developer in the room because he's the guy sitting in the back corner with a stack this big of papers uh, that looks like he hasn't slept in five years because he hasn't slept in five years. I imagine it's just that type of work. Yeah, for real. <laughs> At any rate, uh, so so just like other voice gigs, you're the last guy in and the first guy out, but people have worked for months, weeks, years on what what you're what you're doing. The best of us in the gaming voicing world, it's almost like once you create the relationship with the director in the room, you kind of are channeling that action and flipping through cues and they stop you whenever something doesn't ring true. But as long as it's ringing true, you just keep laying down uh, lines. And then when they have enough for a cinematic, they'll show it back to you and create that whole world for you. Halo Wars was the only game I can think of where we recorded ensemble. Normally, it's it's basically recorded in a vacuum, and it's just you and a microphone creating the whole world. Okay. <clears throat> uh, you had quite a few roles in uh, the Star Wars games, including a uh, the video game version of Episode One: The Phantom Menace, where you played Darth Maul. Uh, yep. You were also in uh, Jedi Academy as uh, Rax Joris, and, and uh, others along with the various voices in uh, Knights of the Old Republic. Or what would you say has been your favorite role in all those games? Oh my God! To, to step into Darth Maul's shoes, die Jedi, die, is uh, it, it's it's legendary. But uh, even even being uh, asked to to sort of learn the language phonetically, all of it. Look, I, I, you talk about iconic that they wrote the book, so uh, any association is is uh, is awesome. But uh, Darth Maul is way up there, and and uh, you know, I, I'm gonna say. Uh, it humbles me to to s step into the robes of a Jedi for any length of time. Uh, now, in the series, in, in Clone Wars and, and Star Wars Rebels, that was uh, particularly of, of note because I'm the first uh, super tactical droid General Kalani. And uh, he sort of... He's an artificial intelligence, or is he? He's almost Spock-like. Is he intentionally cruel? Is he programmed? You know, we don't know and we get to guess. But um, that was a highlight because that was with Dave Filoni in the cast of, of that. Dara O'Farrell did the Star Wars games, and uh, that was earlier on. But, you know, they're, all of these things, you, you become part of... of you become part of the Star Wars history, and frankly, that virtual world is is in some ways more real than the real world. It, it's so detailed, and they care, and you feel how much they care, and they they make that pride known to everybody who joins the franchise. So you know you're you're playing for you're playing for the majors. It's a shame they didn't have you uh, play Darth Maul in, in the, uh, the TV shows at all. Because, uh, if all yeah. yeah, that would have been swell. All they had to do was ask. <laughs> uh, as a voice actor, uh, Greg, uh, most uh, most voice actors are required to do like a role where they have to scream, though. Now, when I had uh, Roger Bumpus on the show, he loved screaming. Pat Music says something funny you drink hot water whatever you're about to scream now what is your uh way to help yourself uh, uh hype yourself up in a screaming aspect i mean you scream as the grumble you scream as corn fed like how do you hype yourself up to uh do a screaming part i say i say uh see the scream be the scream everybody goes home earlier if you just dive in my whole deal is i i i go for 150 percent of whatever it is and if you're falling off a cliff and on fire and being shot with arrows as you fall <laughs> or whatever it is, 
uh, I, I just try to get inside it and let it happen. And more often than not, that way you get it in one take instead of 15 takes if somebody's trying to hold back or protect. And if I know I'm doing a, 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 a war game uh, or, or a screaming part or dying 50 ways, I, I'm very protective when I'm not doing the game. You know, I'm very economical uh, on my downtime and I try to save it for when I need it. Uh, I don't do anything stupid at hot water for sure. Uh, echinacea, zinc, all, all that stuff that sounds like you're pampering yourself, but it's really, an, you, you've got kind of an occupational hazard and you're agreeing to take it on. You want to take it on because you want, you want that character to live in, in all aspects. So I think in a way, doing it full out, actually being in the moment in your head, in your voice, in your body uh, is protective in this weird way that I have a hard time explaining. But by holding it back, it, it almost is more damaging than just doing it. Anyway, I, I, I've screamed plenty. Uh, and uh, those Command and Conquer games, the war games, you essentially are going to war and, and uh, combat is combat. And if, you, if you're doing, if you're doing a combat film, you're going to be doing the same thing in real trenches and, and, and with real uh, artillery going off around you or real fake artillery going off around you. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I, I say by not holding back, you kind of get through all of that more quickly than it, than if it the deal is it has to ring true if it doesn't ring true you're not going home everybody's going to be there until they get what they need and they should I agree. so 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 that that's my whole deal just see it and be it that's fair let, let it happen I agree uh christopher um well uh oh, oh i suppose uh and there's sort of just this overall division between those who actually uh, like the game itself. Uh, Final Fantasy X, I mean. And you did the voice of Jekt in the series itself, uh, in the city of Final Fantasy, as well as in the uh, spin-offs that uh, Jekt had been in. And, uh, what are some of your memories uh, doing that and your favorite lines? You're not crying, are you? <laughs> Somebody had to teach that kid to play blitz ball. Hey, I'm a dad, and I see Jekt as, you know, the, the, there's, a, there's a saying that you do the best you can with the tools that you have. Well, Jekt is firm but fair but firm. Uh, he does too much in his efforts to turn his boy into a man. Uh, but I get him. I I. I I get where he's coming from. And I think that's what makes him an interesting character, but he's, he's definitely a narcissist and he's, he wants everything to come up to his standards and his everything. But, but I get, I have to play the dad, the father in him to make it make sense for me. Um, and also, I don't know if you know, but the, uh, I, I was the body model for Jack. <laughs> I wasn't the body model for Jack. There's a 12 pack in here somewhere, but I can't find it. Uh, uh, I, I, I love Jack, uh, but uh, he probably could be a little more compassionate and a little more understanding. He's neither, uh, but, he, but he wants, what he wants is, is kind of noble is noble, not kinda. Um, and so uh, any anytime you, you create a character like that and then you get invited back and invited back and invited back, you know that you've done something that resonated and that makes me feel really good about uh, my involvement with a show that's so, so beautiful to watch. <laughs> uh Speaking of uh, you know hard, tough uh, fathers, I mean, 
And, you know, you play a character very similar to this on Hey Arnold, where you played the Jolly Ollie Man's father. And I remember, like, the, the line specifically where you said, you know, you're late, Willie. You know, you know, that's not the problem, Willie. You're the problem. And if you don't sell out your shipment, you're fired. Um, <laughs> your thoughts on working on Hey Arnold? It, it, it was it, it there's that ilk of nickelodeon show that that they have some element of truth to them and some element of fun to them it's all of the above but uh i did a, a number of hey arnold's just dropping in in different characters um i think there's yeah there's a fireman there's there's a, a bunch of different stuff but all these shows that they, they create some reality uh family reality to themselves and neighborhood reality and uh yeah i mean i don't want to sound like everything is is just roses but kind of everything is just roses I, I i love my involvement in all of those shows i take my involvement seriously i try to figure out now when you're a guest on somebody else's show it's kind of like playing uh, a double dutch game of, of a jump rope because you got to figure out the dynamic of the show how you fit you don't want to do too much you don't want to do too little you just want to you want it to feel like you've always been there and that's kind of a that's kind of a little delicate tightrope to walk but but that's that's part of the joy of it um so yeah i i'm proud of my involvement i think that's another phenomenal show that could go on and on and on and on if it wanted to i agree uh, Christopher? Uh, getting back to your work in video games, uh, you did quite a few number of roles in EverQuest 2. Uh -huh. uh, lines like a, 112 roles. I, I don't remember any lines from it. I just remember uh, uh, that, that they would say, uh, oh, we got another character. Oh, we got three more characters. Oh, can you, can you do this? And uh, now you're in a tavern and, and uh, we're going to do... So they just kept throwing things and uh, occasionally they'd say no that turned out to be too much like this that you did a week and a half ago uh let's go here but let's change this and change this honestly that was more like serving the piece by just being spoon-fed whatever it was uh that they needed i really appreciate the trust um because they they just kept saying how about this how about this how about this and when it worked they said yeah the word that's it we're doing it we're done um, so I just kept coming back, but as far as lines, no, I, I, I got nothing. <laughs> I see. Um, and, uh, Greg, before we conclude, uh, Chris and I have just a couple of more questions before we conclude, though. Um, one of my questions I definitely have to ask you is Orson or Cornfed? Don't ask me which of my children I, is my favorite. I, I love them both for different reasons. Orson, just, just the notion of keeping Wade off the ledge and, and saying, Wade, you're afraid of everything, mate. I've never seen anything like it. You're afraid of the water, afraid of the dark, afraid of the nighttime too, the sun and the shade. I'm really afraid, Wade. What do we do with you? <laughs> oh no, my brothers are coming. <laughs> and Cor <clears throat> Cornfed's been everywhere, seen everything, knows everyone, dated leggy models. He's done whatever it is that needs to be done. And yet his loyalty in spite of everything, is still to the duck. I also loved when you said, as Cord fed, not only is he not understanding the word you're saying, but you're crushing his priceless arm. <laughs> 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 oh, and um, definitely we had so many guest stars. I mean, they, uh, Duckman had more... Uh, just as much guest stars as The Simpsons did. Uh, we had Bob Guccione. We had Joe Walsh, uh, Joe Montaigne. Uh, we had Chris Elliott. Uh, we had so many guest stars. Uh, Tim Curry, uh, another one. Who would, uh, Eddie Deason. Uh, who was your favorite guest star on Duckman? Oh, man. I'm not trying to cop out. It, it's a tie for first place. You know, to be sitting across from Joe Walsh, that means something to me. Oh, okay. Without a doubt, without a doubt, James Brown, who I get to introduce when Duckman is holed up in that shed. And uh, I say, uh, well, something like, if, if we can't make you come out with reason and rationale, maybe the Godfather soul. 
can make you come. The, the Godfather of Soul, Mr. James, and he comes on and says, Duck man, get out of that shit, or whatever whatever he says. But <laughs> but I grew up in St. Louis, and he was there with his entourage. I said, there were a group of us. I, I said, I saw you every time you played Keel Auditorium in St. Louis. I said, one of my friend's parents was a show promoter, and he would get us seats in in, in that hot sweaty auditorium uh and he said oh keel auditorium keel auditorium i love the keel auditorium st louis st louis audience is a great audience and i just thought again like what i was saying at the start of the interview this happened in my real life i'm sitting there talking to james brown not only am i talking to james brown but he's on our show uh these things happen you know it i just i just kiss the ground uh at the opportunities that i've had absolutely wow thanks for asking i i that that's definitely uh he he was he was ahead of the rest but victoria principal crispin glover uh people would just you just never knew who was going to show up and i i heard that there was an even longer line of people who loved the show and asked to be on it um and uh we had that kind of we had that kind of cult following it's kind of hard to find it because they kept changing our time slot uh and moving it around again that's why i would love to see all the originals come back and find a new audience and then do more i love that show those people that that old deal absolutely and it did end on a cliffhanger when we find out beatrice was not only alive but corn fed knew about it what are you gonna do we gotta find out don't we absolutely <laughs> <laughs> totally agree uh Chris Mutes and revivals are a thing writers make it happen yes see and keep those cards and the emails coming in i'm sure they get read absolutely uh christopher your uh final questions out of every role you have played throughout your entire career which would you say stands out to you as the most memorable and fun to do? It's embarrassing. Again, it's a tie for first place. Just because of, see, I can't discount longevity and actually having the arc of, of Grimlock over years and, and uh, the Garfield show and Garfield and Friends over years where where it's not just a role there there's 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 an arc of what happens to that character and even the multiple seasons of of men in black and for sure duck man and and being asked to uh to be one of the eors for disney my god what incredible hooves to step into and that's basically corn fed without the energy not really, but uh, they sent me home with tapes of the original Eeyore, Ralph Wright. And uh, it's just so iconic that the thought of being allowed to do it still humbles me. Oh, bother. <laughs> That's right. You were Eeyore in the, the uh, Winnie the Pooh games that Disney had. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. Oh. I'm a lucky, I'm a very fortunate, I, 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 I think it's hard. I like whoever said the harder I work, the luckier I get. Cause you can't, you can't put it all off to, to luck. There's work involved and there's study involved and there's improvisation involved and there's acting class involved and there's theater involved and the ability to listen and the ability to stay spontaneous it's everything. You're the sum total of everything you've ever done. And when I teach and when I coach, the first thing I tell people is the biggest part of what you do is who you are. It's all those life experiences that you find a way to apply to characters that you're asked to do. You got to make it, you got to make it human or human. Uh, you've you've got to bring humanity, even if it's a, a galactic battle or a creature or or uh, you know you can you can be any gender any any uh you can be anything it's your voice you know the sky's the limit 
So um, I just, uh, I, I'm very grateful. I feel like I've had great good fortune, but I'm not afraid of doing the work either. Absolutely. And you know what? That's why, you know what? You're a voice acting legend, Mr. Berger. You're not only voice acting legend, but you could, t you could read the phone book and make it entertaining. <laughs> That's how, you know, charismatic and how uh, uh, like awesome you are as a voice actor. And before we conclude, though, this is the part of the show where I allow uh, my guest stars, because this is an open forum, you could talk about anything, you could say anything you like. The floor is now yours, Mr. Berger. Um. I'm going to go back to where we started. I was using myself as the example, but I believe that opportunity happens for everyone. And if you mistake it for just another moment, that's what it becomes. If opportunity passes your way, if it starts to waft by, seize it. Uh, and, you know, when you're allowed to do what it is you love doing, you don't feel uh, the work aspect of it because you're too busy enjoying the fact that you've been blessed with the ability to do what it is you love doing. <clears throat> the, uh, the important thing in earlier parts of your life is figuring out what it is that you love doing, feeding it, and uh, should that opportunity find its way to you, that's when it's important that you've done your homework, that you're ready uh, because it has it has to be a perfect storm. It has to be a harmonic convergence when opportunity meets meets uh, training. You have to you have to do your training so that you're ready uh, when and if opportunity finds you. I'm a terminal optimist. It'll kill me someday, but you get to die with a smile on your face like the one I have right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to say, though, like the premise of my show has always been not, and absolutely not for fame or fortune. It's actually the opposite. Like, you know, it's my it's my way to say thank you. S say thank you, Greg, for all those memories that you've given me as a child watching all the shows that, you know, I grew up watching you. Like, whether it was Iron Monsters, Garfield, Duckman, um, playing Metal Gear Solid, you know, just, like those memories. This was a way for me to say thank you and pay homage to any guest star. Like, I mean, to, I mean, I actually wanted to pay homage to you now. You mentioned that, you know, one of the songs that you loved doing as Orson was Wade, You're Afraid. I remember another song that you sang, and it's one of my favorite songs you sang. And this is where you can go from an emote, like you can, you know, emote tremendously as an actor, a voice actor. And then you can also uh, speak and sing so eloquently and so beautiful. And Thanks, man. No problem. And I will never forget the one song, and you'll probably remember this too. It was on uh, uh, U.S. Uh, Acre, uh, Orson, Orson Farm, and that is, Does your nose feel like a banana or your toes uh, shape like Indiana? Do your ears seem bigger than Montana? Dry those tears. We understand you. Hey, everyone has something unique about them. That's what makes us all special. Don't you just wish you could look in the mirror and say, yo, banana nose. Now you know how my sailboat goes. <laughs> ears, Montana ears. I have ears so my sister can steer. Hey, 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 Indiana toes. Getting me across those winter falls. Whatever the name, I'm still the same nice person Woo! I, I thought i had to pay tribute to that um, nicely done absolutely uh, uh, of course uh, you deserve it i mean uh, you know just again um thank you for not only doing this interview but thank you for those childhood memories you gave me and in fact i waited a long time to do this and you deserve this sir and that is thank you greg thank you greg thank you greg um christopher any final uh closing uh closing uh, things you want to say Greg Berger, thank you for all the memories. I pretty much uh, probably haven't been this nervous to actually uh, meet a voice actor celebrity like yourself, like, at all of my life. Because, uh, yeah, the night before, like, prior to actually doing this, I was really just uh, feeling the stress of uh, the interview itself, possibly coming off a trekkie, asking you, like, obscure questions you just wouldn't really be able to answer. Oh, go and, on. <laughs> no, really, go on. 
but let's go on, Chris. Uh, not uh, not only are you a legend, sir, but you are also like you know, if there was a Hall of Fame for voice actors, I would say put Greg Berger in, please. Thanks, man. I very much appreciate it. Anytime, sir. It was a pleasure and honor. Thank you for making me feel like a little kid again. Hey, Petey, it's an awesome podcast. Thank you, and uh, you know, I so I'm so honored to have you on. Like, you know. I feel like this four-year-old again, like uh, meeting one of my voice acting idols. Thanks, Christopher. Thanks, Petey. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. Have a good night, Christopher. Have a good night, sir. You as well. Bye-bye. Take it easy.